In this video, we're going to answer a question that has sort of been underlying the previous two videos um, dealing with the fundamental theorem of line integrals and path independence, and that is, how can we determine whether a given vector field is actually conservative? How can we determine if a vector field f is the potent or is the gradient vector field for some potential function f? In this video, we're going to focus on the two-dimensional case where our vector field f is a vector field with two components. Um, a lot of this can be generalized to three dimensions, um, but that does take a little bit more work. Right. So to get started um, in the two-dimensional case, let's suppose that I have a vector field, capital F, and it's given by scalar fields P and Q. In other words, I can write cap my vector field as PI plus QJ. Um, and let's suppose to begin with that it is conservative. Right? Now I know the re I know we're trying to determine whether it, one is conservative, but one approach we could take is by looking at a conservative vector field and see what properties it must have. And then any vector field that doesn't have those properties cannot possibly be conservative. Right? So if I have this conservative vector field, I know that that means it is the gradient vector for some function lowercase f. And so I'll just introduce this potential function here. Right. So under in this in this in this scenario, um, um, we know that p, the scalar function, that course the the first component of capital F, is equal to uh, del f del x, the derivative of f with respect to x. That's the first component of the gradient. And we know that q is going to be del f del y. Right? But because these are both the second components of f and gradient of f of lowercase f, respectively. Now, assuming both functions p and q have continuous derivatives, we can apply Clarout's theorem. So using Clarout's theorem, we know that the mixed second order partials of f have to be equal, again, under the assumption that p and q have continuous derivatives. In other words, a del squared f over del y del x must equal del squared f del x del y. Right? These are the two mixed partial second derivatives for function lowercase f. Well, del squared f del y del x is the derivative of del f del x with respect to y. In other words, this is equal to del p del y. Right? Del, remember p is equal to del f del x, and so if we differentiate that with respect to x, we get um, one of the mixed partials. And on the other hand, del squared f del x del y is simply del q del x. Um, and again, that's because q is equal to del f del y. And so what we see is if we differentiate p with respect to y and q with respect to x, we get the two mixed ordered partial derivatives of f, of the potential function f, and by Clarout's theorem, these must be equal. All right, and so we get a very, very useful theorem out of this. Um, and the theorem says as follows, it's if we have a, a vector field capital F, which is pi, plus qj, so we have their scalar functions p and q, and if it's conservative, um, with p and q um, having continuous derivatives, then we must have del p del y equal to del q del x. So the only real assumption here is that p and q have continuous derivatives, and that is so that we can apply Clarout's theorem as above. Right? Now, the real use of this, even though the assumption here is that we are of a conservative vector field to begin with, the real usefulness comes from thinking about this statement logically. If I have a vector field and I can show that del p del y and del q del x are not equal, then we can conclude 
that that vector field is not conservative. And that's simply because conservative vector fields have this property. So any vector field that does not have this property cannot possibly be conservative. Um, for those of you that, that know some formal logic, what I'm saying is um, I'm talking about the contrapositive of this particular theorem. And this is a really useful uh, result to show if a, a, a vector field is not um, conservative. Right? So for example, let's say we wanted to look at this particular vector field. So f of x, y is going to be given by x squared plus y and 1 minus 3x. So x squared plus y is our p, 1 minus 3x is q. And our, the question we want to address here is, is f conservative? Right? And so what we're going to do is we're going to compute the two quantities from the previous theorem that conservative vector fields have um, being equal, and we're going to see what happens. So we're just going to compute del p del y. So differentiate that first function with respect to y, and that's 1. We're going to compute del q uh, del x. Right? In this case, that's negative 3. And so what we observe is that these are not equal. Right? Um, hopefully that's obvious, that 1 and negative 3 are not the same value. Um, and so if f were conservative, then by the theorem we just saw, these two values would have to be equal, but they're not. And so um, by that previous theorem, we know for a fact that this function is not conservative. Right? This vector field is not conservative. In other words, there is no potential function, lowercase f, which has a derivative with respect to x being x squared plus y, and a derivative with respect to y being 1 minus 3x. So much like um, this example, we can often use the, the theorem we just mentioned to show vector fields are not conservative, but we cannot use it to show that a vector field is conservative. So in order to do that, we need to do a little bit more work. So given the fact that we know about conservative vector fields, we could ask the following question. We could ask that if a vector field satisfies this condition, del p del y equaling del q del x, right, so if this equality is true, can we conclude that f is conservative? And um, for those that know some formal logic, what we're asking here is if the converse of the statement of that theorem is true. And unfortunately, with converses, sometimes they're true and sometimes they're not. And so logic doesn't really help us in this particular case. However, the answer to this question is yes, at least on nice regions. Um, and in this context, I'm going to, um, you, I'm just going to, we're just going to use the word nice. We're not going to look at any regions that are not nice, but the technical term here, um, if you're interested is, um, something called simply connected. Um, and it essentially means, again, there's a more technical definition, but this simple definition will suffice for us. Um, it's connected with no holes. Right. We know what connected means. Um, I would mentioned it before and said that I would not mention it again, so I guess I lied previously. Um, but um, in this case, um, connected simply means you can get from one point to another um, without leaving the region. And no holes means, um, well, no holes. So um, for example, what we want to think of is something like this, some kind of blobbish region. This one is simply connected. We can get from any point to any other point without leaving the space, and there are no holes. Um, whereas this region here, 
like this um, circle with a hole removed, this is not simply connected because it does have um, a hole. However, notice the second space is the second region is connected. Um, you can get from any point to in the in the region to any other point without leaving it, but it's not simply connected. So on simply connected regions, then this equation at the top, del p del y equals del q del x, is good enough. Um, and so let's state that formally. All right. So again, we're going to have our vector field f given with scalar fun or scalar fields p and q. So p i plus q j. Um, so we're going to let this be a vector field. on a simply connected region. Right, which we'll call D for the domain. Um, and we're going to suppose P and Q have continuous first order derivatives. And that del p del y equals del q del x. So the first derivatives are continuous, and these two particular first derivatives are equal. So under all of this, the vector field f is conservative. And so what this allows us to do, um, in addition to what we did in the previous example, where we could show that these two quantities being unequal um, tell us that the vector field is not conservative, this does tell us, um, on at least these simply connected regions, that um, the, func the vector field would, in fact, be con conservative. All right, so let's take an, an, another look at another example. So let's define a vector field with by 3 plus 2xy times i uh, plus x squared minus 3y squared j. So there's a vector field with two components. And the question we have here is, is f conservative? Um, and so um, we're going to simply compute the, the appropriate derivatives. Um, here we have two, the components P and Q are both um, nice polynomials, so all the derivatives are going to be continuous, so we have nothing to worry about there. Uh, so when we differentiate, we have del P del Y um, is going to be equal to 2x, right, the coefficient of Y in that second term, 2xy, and del Q del X um, is going to be just the derivative of x squared, which is 2x. And so these two derivatives are equal. Right? And so as long as we are working on um, a simply connected region, which in this case we're thinking of the entire plane, which is certainly simply connected, um, that this vector function is conservative. And so this means we know this particular vector field is the gradient vector for some function f. Well, that leads naturally to the question, what is a potential function for this particular conservative vector field? Right? And how can we find it? Right? So we need to consider what we know about this situation. All right, so we know that if I take this potential function f and I take its derivative with respect to x, that I get the first component of our vector field, 
which must be in which in this case we know is 3 plus 2xy. Right? That is the first component of capital F. And so that has to be the derivative partial with respect to x of our potential function. And similarly, the partial with of the potential function in, with respect to y needs to equal the second component of our vector fun of our vector field, which is x squared minus 3y squared. Right? So we need to know a function f which has both of these partial derivatives. Right? And so one approach that we can take is to pick one of these two partials and anti-differentiate with respect to the given variable. So I'm going to start with f sub x um, and start with this first derivative. I know this is the, the derivative with respect to x, so I'm going to anti-differentiate this with respect to x. And so f of x, y, the function itself, um, 3, the antiderivative of that is 3x. For 2xy, we're going to have to integrate x and we get x squared over 2. The 2s will cancel, and so we get x squared plus, or I'm sorry, x squared times y. Um, but then, as whenever we anti-differentiate, we need to have an arbitrary constant on here. Now you might just go ahead and quickly write plus c like you expect, like you would typically in, in single variable calculus. But remember, we want a function that is continuous in terms of x. That means that we could have a function that's simply in terms of y added on here. So I'm just going to write this constant as g of y. g of y could be very simple. It could be a constant. It could also be something very complicated in terms of y. Um, but any function that just involves y, when we differentiate with respect to x, we will get simply 0 in that for that term, or those multiple terms. And so f has this particular form, 3x plus x squared y plus g of y. So now I'm going to take this function, I'm going to differentiate it with respect to y. So I'm now going to compute f sub y of x sub y, of x and y. So 3x, the derivative is 0. For x squared y, it's simply x squared, and the derivative of g of y is what we would normally say in Calc 1 as g prime of y. There's only one variable to differentiate there. Right. All right. So now what we're going to realize is that we now have two different ways of writing f sub y. We have x squared plus g prime of y, and we have x squared minus 3y squared. And so these have to be equal to each other. Um, they're both the, the first derivative with respect to y of this function. And so from this, I can conclude that g prime of y has to equal 3y squared. All right, just by removing the, oh, I'm sorry, negative 3y squared um, by removing x squared from both sides of this equation, just subtracting it off. Right? And so if g prime of y is negative 3y squared, then g of y um, must be negative y cubed uh, plus some constant, uh, say k. Right? I don't want to use c because c often is used to denote a curve um, in line integral context, so usually uh, most people use k. But of course, if you really want to use c, you can. Um, but in this case, I have g of y being this particular function. And so I'm just going to take this expression and substitute it back in um, to our previous um, equation here. And so we know that our potential function f of x, y, f of x and y is equal to 3x plus x squared y minus y cubed right, plus some arbitrary constant k. And so we can pick any of these um, to be our um, potential function. We can pick any, va any value of k will work. And of course, you can always check. You can differentiate this with respect to x and with respect to y, and we will get the derivatives that are at the top of the screen. Um, and you don't even really have to do this. As long as we do the anti-differentiating correctly, um, the, that is guaranteed to happen. And so this is our potential function for um, the line integral that we saw on the previous slide. Right. So now that we know that that vector field is conservative and we have a, a potential function for it, we can quite easily compute a line integrals of this vector field. So for example, let's say I want to do evaluate the line integral over C of f dr. Um, where c 
is given by um, the vector function r of t, um, which is e to the t sine t, e to the t cosine t, uh, from t being 0 to pi. Right? And our vector field f is the vector field that we just uh, considered. Uh, 3 plus 2xy and x squared minus 3y squared. Right. right now, if we had to do this by, by definition, we'd have to substitute in um, e to the t sine of t for x and e to the t cosine t for y into our vector field r. We'd have to compute r prime, which is not difficult, but notice we would have to use a product rule for derivatives in each case. So they're going to be um, very, they're going to be longer term. Um, each component is going to have multiple terms. And then we have to take a dot product and then integrate this. Um, if you feel like that's going to be easy to do, feel free to do it. Um, it's not very pleasant. Um, however, we just showed this, since this is the vector field we just looked at, we just showed that this vector field F, um, it was conservative. Right? And we actually found a potential function for it as well. And so we know that if it's conservative, it is independent of path. Right, this is uh, simply the statement of the fundamental theorem of line integrals. Um, that if we have a conservative vector field, if it's the potential function for some, or if it's the gradient vec uh, vector field for some potential function f, then it is independent of path. And so what we really need to know about this curve C is it's starting and ending point. So we know it starts at the point R of 0. Um, so if we let T be 0 in the formula for R, we get E to the 0 sine of 0. And sine of 0 is 0, so x, the x coordinate is 0. And the second coordinate, we get E to the 0, which is 1, and cosine of 0, which is 1. So it starts at the point 0, 1, and it ends at the point r of pi, um, which is equal to um, e to the pi sine of pi, which is again 0, and e to the pi cosine of pi, which is going to be negative e to the pi. Right? And so, just as a reminder, our potential function that we wrote down um, moments ago is the function f of x, y equals 3x uh, plus x squared y minus y cubed. And we had a plus k. I'm just going to pick any potential function. I'll let the constant equal 0 um, for simplicity there. And so by the fundamental theorem of line integrals, this line integral that we want is simply um, f of 0, negative e to the pi, minus f of 0, 1. Right? And if you compute all of this out, um, we see that this is going to be e to the 3 pi, uh, minus, I'm sorry, plus 1. It's minus negative 1, which becomes positive 1. And so, um, without having to do any of the sort of tedious calculus that comes from differentiating that complicated vector function, um, evaluating f at r, and then taking the dot product and then integrating that on, on the interval 0 to pi, we can simply just figure out the starting point and the end point and ignore this path. Ignore the path e to the t sine t, e to the t to cosine t, and just look at the two endpoints, evaluate them at the potential function that we previously found, um, and then just subtract those values, and we get this value relatively quickly. So I want to end this video by considering an example um, of a vector field with three components. All right. All right, so let's say I have this vector field f with components y squared, uh, 2xy, plus e to the 3z, and 3y e to the 3z plus 1. 
Now, as I mentioned earlier, there is a sort of analogous condition to show a vector field with three components is conservative, um, similar to the um, test where we looked at del p, del y, and del q, del x in the two-dimensional case, uh, but it's a little bit more complicated. So we're going to skip over that um, for now, and I'm just going to flat out tell you that this particular one is conservative. Um, however, we could also show that it's conservative by actually finding a potential function. Right? If we're able to find a potential function um, for this particular um, vector field, then we know, of course, that it is conservative. And so we don't necessarily need a test to tell us that it's conservative if we can find the, the potential function, but the test is just nice to tell us that there's no potential function so we don't waste our time looking for something that doesn't exist. Right? And really, to find the potential function, we're just going to mimic what we did in the two-variable case. Um, we know that the partial of this function with respect to x is going to be our first component, y squared. We know that the partial of our function in terms of with respect to y is going to be our second component, 2xy plus e to the 3z. And our partial of f with respect to z is going to be our third component, 3y e to the 3z plus 1. Right? And so again, we can pick one of these three partial derivatives um, and anti-differentiate. Um, and again, I'm going to pick f sub x, but there's no reason that I have to always pick f sub x. You can pick whichever one is simplest. Um, in the previous example we did, they were both sort of equally simple. You could have tried doing it the other way and you would have probably gotten an, um, an answer in about the same amount of work. In this case, I think if you look at these three uh, partial derivatives, the one that's easiest to deal with is y squared. Um, so if I differentiate, or if I anti-differentiate this particular derivative, I'm going to get a function f of x, y, z, equals x, y squared, and then I have an arbitrary constant. And that arbitrary constant in this case has to be a function of y and z. Right? Any function that, that has just variables y and z involved, when differentiated with respect to x, becomes zero. And so we have g of y, um, y and z. Right? So now I have this function. I've used f sub x. Now I want to differentiate this with respect to y or z. Um, and again, it's sort of just a matter of, of preference um, and how you want to do this. Um, but I notice I have an xy squared here, and I know if I differentiate that with respect to y, I get 2xy, which is part of f sub y above. And so I'm going to differentiate this with respect to y because I recognize that there's going to be that piece um, related. Um, and so f sub y here will be 2xy plus g sub y of y, z. All right, so I don't want to use the prime notation here because that is a function of two variables. All right, but now to compare that with f sub y that we have here, we know that is 2xy plus e to the 3z. All right, and so by comparing um, these two equations, but, but these two expressions and the fact that they're equal, we can subtract 2xy and we see that g sub y of y z is equal to the function e of e to the 3z. So if g sub y, if the partial of g with respect to y is e to the 3z, that tells us that g of y z must have the form y e to the 3z plus some function that's simply in terms of z. Let's call that h of z. Right, because any function that's just in terms of z, when differentiated, um, will become 0 with respect to y. Right, so we have g of y, z um, being this form. And so we can substitute this back in for to g of y, z in our formula for f that we previously had. Right, so this results in a function f of, y, f of x, y, z which is going to equal 2xy plus y e to the z e to the 3z plus h of z. Right? Now this function, as we've seen now, has the appropriate derivative with respect to x and with respect to y. And so all we need to do 
is to now look at the derivative with respect to z. And so when we compute f sub z, uh, 2xy becomes 0. y e to the 3z um, with the chain rule becomes 3y e to the 3z. And of course, h of z, the derivative, is just h prime of z. And since that's a single variable function, we can write uh, use the prime notation. All right, now we already saw that the derivative of f with respect to z was going to equal 3y e to the 3z um, plus 1. And so comparing these two um, derivatives with respect to z, we see that h prime of z is going to equal 1, and therefore h of z is going to simply equal z plus some arbitrary constant k. And so our final step to find the potential function here is to substitute this back in to our function f. And we now have our um, complete potential function 2xy plus y e to the 3z plus z uh, plus our arbitrary constant k. So we can substitute whatever value k we want in there. And now that we've create now that we've um, found this function, we can conclude without any kind of other any other additional um, understanding that we do have a, a conservative vector field because we found the potential function um, that works for, um, that gives us um, as a gradient the vector field that we started with. Um, and so now if we wanted to integrate that vector field, um, over some kind of curve, as complicated of a curve as we want, all we would need to do is determine the endpoints of the curve, substitute them into um, this expression for f of x, y, z, um, and subtract those two function values, and that would be the value of that line integral.